Today on the Shape It Up Over 40 podcast, we are talking about a mindful approach to menopause. My special guest is going to dive into three components needed to thrive through menopause. If you're a woman over 40 and you are looking to lose weight for the last time, you are in the right spot. Welcome to the Shape It Up Over 40 podcast. My name is Nicole Simonin and I'm your host. And we all know that we need to move more and eat less but why don't we do it? I give clients the skill sets they need through fitness, nutrition, and most importantly, mindset, because that's the missing piece to all this. So if you've tried a ton of diets and are still looking for the latest and greatest 12 week workout program and still haven't seen results, it's the mindset part that is missing for you. So when you become a client, you will not just learn how to lose a weight, but you're gonna learn how to keep it off for life. I hope you will enjoy this podcast, and when you're ready to lose the weight for the last time, head over to shapeitupfitness.com and schedule your strategy session where possibility starts and results begin. Everybody, welcome to the Shape It Up Over 40 podcast. I'm so glad you're here today. My guest today has journeyed from corporate leader to helping others steer their way through menopause. It began when she suffered a burnout during menopause, and she had to reassess how she was living her life. Today, she is a menopause transition specialist whose approach is founded on neuroscience, mindfulness, and women's health. She helps women transform their journey through perimenopause to postmenopause. She is a neuroscientist, certified health and mindfulness coach, and the author of The Mindful Menopause and the host of Thriving Through Menopause podcast. So welcome, Clarissa Christensen. Did I get it right? Yay! Yay. <laughs> Hi, Nicole. I'm so glad to be here. Delighted. I am so glad you're here. Now, tell everyone where you are residing. I live in Gothenburg on the west coast of Sweden right that, now. I, you are my first international guest, so welcome. <laughs> oh, exciting. <laughs> it is so exciting. It's amazing how, like, technology, you know, I mean, we would have never met each other. 10 years, 20 years ago, whatever. I mean, unless I was wandering around Europe, maybe. <laughs> but it's fascinating <laughs> that we can connect with so many different people. So I'm excited that you are my first international guest. So tell the listeners a little bit about your past and how you wound up where you are today. Yeah, so you, you mentioned a little there in the bio intro, Nicole. Yes, I was a corporate leader. I spent more than 25 years in a variety of major multinationals whose brands everybody has in their cupboards. And um, I loved my job. I mean, you know, I worked, I worked from coming in as a graduate and worked up to leading big teams, multinational teams. And when I was in my mid forties, I, uh, I had a, a bit of a life crisis in that my mother got dementia and she passed away. Oh, and that's okay. a very, you know, it's a very painful, stressful thing. And at the same time, my husband had a bank, a business that went bankrupt. Mm-hmm. And we ended up separating. And, you know, as you do at 46, I, I emigrated to Australia with <laughs> <laughs> a, dog, a dog and a seven-year-old boy, <laughs> which was a big life change for me. Yeah. And I, I started up building my career there and just worked so hard. I mean, I don't think I would have been very different from many women today. I'm juggling too many balls in the air. And at the same time, I'm going into perimenopause and, you know, in eventually I just gave up. It was like everything was just too much. Mm -hmm. My health was very poor. I suffered from anxiety I had a number of blackouts. My blood pressure was oh, wow. very high. And, you know, I was pushing on, pushing on, you know, living what I thought was the way you lived your life. And mm-hmm. then eventually I, I changed job. And that was the this thing that broke me, really. And I, so, I just stood outside of my office. Yes. Oh, yes. I was going to ask you. So when you moved to Australia, you started your own job or you were working for someone? Oh, no, I was still working for someone. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> in, I thought you company, started. I, I, I was say, if I said it's a big company based in Atlanta, there's a lot of people who love <laughs> that uh, red machine is. <laughs> <Uh-oh>. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> and, um, and I, um, that, but I changed job. 
and I thought, well, I'll go to a smaller company. And it really wasn't any smaller or any easier. Uh, okay. And all I did was I stood there and I just remember about two months in, not even that, burst into tears. And I thought, I can't do this anymore. Mm. Something has to change. Yeah. And so that begins a journey of self-discovery, of having to really look at the way I was living my life and you know, start to wind back this very high intensity uh, superwoman mindset that I had. Like, mm -hmm. you know, that's not unusual for us to do that. We're told that we can have it all, all at once. <laughs> right. So we right. go for it. <laughs> well, not only that, but the situation that you were in, I mean, if you were divorced and now you have to take care of your son and, and the, and now, and you also put yourself in a whole nother continent basically. So yeah, I mean, the stress levels alone, just from those things are, are enough to make you be like, I have to do everything. I have to survive. So, yeah. And I think that's right. You hit the nail on the head. I felt I had to survive. I didn't have any family at, when I arrived in Australia. I have a lot of wonderful friends now who are like family, <laughs> but you know, that was like building everything from the ground up. And if you do that at 20, 25, that that's fine. When you do it at 45, it's a lot harder. But uh, eventually, as I said, I had to wind things back. And I actually trained initially to become a mindfulness practitioner. That was my very first sort of steps to putting myself back on track. And that it allowed a reintroduction of meditation and yoga back into my life. Because I'm so busy, you put these things on the back burner. And when you have a small child and you're working full time, you're not the first person on the list quite right, often. Right. So that really came back on track. And then I found that, you know, my passion was the menopause and that women shouldn't need to uh, go around sleepwalking into it like I did, you know, blindly not knowing anything. I mean, knowing that this was something that happened and your periods ended, but not understanding the impact that that in combination with stress has mm. on our physical body and not understanding at that stage very much about women's health and why we need to take a different approach as we get into our middle years, if we're going to live well. <laughs> right, that's the key. <laughs> <laughs> not the craziness that I have. Um, and I don't know how it is over uh, in your neck of the woods, but I find that the people that I interact with, a lot of people don't know there's a thing called perimenopause. They just assume that you are, you know, having it and then you're not. And I'm like, no, there's a whole 10 year transition in there that, you know, and I don't think, and maybe that's what people think menopause is as you're transitioning. Mm -hmm. um, but by definition, you know, perimenopause is right before and menopause is when it stops. Um, so I think the, a lot of people just don't understand the whole aspect of perimenopause. So I'm so glad that you're on here and we are going to talk about how to thrive through menopause using your three components. So do you yes. want to touch on those? Yes. Um, well, the way I look at that is, is firstly that to do that, we need to have a lot more awareness of ourselves, our, our bodies and what is actually happening because if we stumble through it, well, we're starting with a mindset that either we think it's some horrific journey, you know, some sort of nightmare, which <laughs> isn't helped by a million Facebook groups that are about as negative as they can be, mm. uh, or celebrities going, this was a hell, it was, you know, I was devastated. And people then approach this with a lot of trepidation and fear, which sets up a mindset that's not a healthy one. And obviously, if you are negative, it's now known that you will experience your symptoms more, more intensely. Yes. So having awareness of what is going on. So good information is part of my thing that people need access to factual, correct information and that educating women actually pre menopause is, is a long-term goal, but at least when you get to that age, you, you shouldn't be going around asking questions like, is this normal? Well, we're all different. Right. So nothing is normal. It's common. That's a distinction, but understanding a bit about our own basic biology. And then for ourselves, learning what I didn't learn was to listen to my body. It's sending us incredible signals when things aren't right. Mm. And understanding whether that's actually 
your estrogen and progesterone hormones or whether it's actually stress because the some of the symptoms look very similar or that's a combination of the two so that we can do what we need to do awareness is gives us the opportunity to start to work on well what are my symptoms what triggers those symptoms mm. if i have you know, and a hot flash is an easy symptom. I mean, it's a very common one. I don't think it's the most debilitating one. And women themselves would, would probably say that it's not. But we understand that things like red wine or coffee or a stressful situation can actually make your hot flash go. Whoosh. Well, mm. if we understand that, you know, we're aware of that yeah. because we're paying attention. Guess what? We can do something about that. So part of that awareness is also putting ourselves back into the driver's seat. I have to say, now I am going to be 47 in the summer. And I have been saying since I was 40 that I cannot wait for hot flashes because I am always cold. <laughs> now, <laughs> I might change my mind when one actually happens. <laughs> But be um, one of twenty percent that doesn't have that, you know. That's, that's, that's true. The way it is, you know. Yeah, yeah. We're not all susceptible to it. Yeah. But you know, if you have one, it's like a bit like being boiled up from the inside. <laughs> <laughs> I think I have them at night sometimes. Yeah, like night. I just get hot, and um, but again, it's nothing. And again, too, you know, when people talk about hot flashes, their perception of the intensity, the the drama behind it is their perception. So like another person could be like, Oh yeah, I'm a little hot, you know? So I think that's exactly. interesting too. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that really is my first bringing that awareness to yourself. So I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer in that we should be tracking our symptoms mm -hmm. and looking at what is going on here. You know, I'm having this symptom. How intense is it? When does it happen? What else is going wrong? What did I eat, drink, whatever? We're building that awareness of ourselves so that one, we can have control. Secondly, we can have a better conversation with our physician. Most mm. of our physicians have little or no training. It's not their fault. We don't, we don't blame them. That's the way med schools are set up. But if you come there and say, well, I think I feel like this, he's either going to tell you it's in your head or you're not old enough or whatever. But if you come and mm. say, well, actually, here's my, here's my chart. This is what the things I notice and observe. Do you think I'm in perimenopause? Do I need could I have some tests? What is it you can do for me? You're, you are already much more in control of your own health. And that's really important for women to be. We don't, shouldn't be delegating that to other people. Yeah, I agree 100% with that. Um, I know for me, again, since I, when I turned 40, I kept going to my doctor. I was like, are you sure? Are you sure I'm not going through this? Because I've got some of these symptoms, going on, you know, and, um, and they're like, no, the blood test says no. And I'm like, well, I think the blood test is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I am definitely very proactive when it comes to my health. And I always, you know, try to convey that to um, my clients as well, because, you know, I, like you're saying, doctors have a certain knowledge. And I think as our own advocate, we can kind of investigate, you know, what's going on. And, and a lot of times doctors, I mean, I was in the medical field in physical therapy, and we just have the textbooks. And if you're not kind of following or fitting into that mold of the textbook, a lot of times they're, they're, it's just like you said, it, it, you know, they think it's your mind, like you're making things up or you're imagining things. Um, so yeah, I definitely to be proactive in your own medical health for sure. Don't yeah, go so Googling your symptoms and treat that way. <laughs> Make sure you're, you know. Well, I mean, some of, I think go to, go to either someone who, who is a knowledgeable or find a reputable right. site. I mean, there are very reputable websites that at least are factually correct. Correct. That are either run by <laughs> the North American Menopause Society or whoever. Then you can turn around and you say, well, that person is factually correct. There may be things that you don't like the tonality or the way they approach things, but they are correct. Don't use Google and Facebook can lead you down your know, wormholes where you don't necessarily need to be, yeah. but try and be at least there because at least then, you know, you're not alone and it's not, most things are common and somebody else has had something similar to, to you, even though right. your length, severity, cocktail of symptoms is yours but be aware. That's my number one um, thing. Yeah. The second thing I would be saying is to build some acceptance yourself of this situation. Mm 
Mm. You know, what is, um, you know, we have to accept that we're going through this. We, we, can fight, we can't fight it. it. Every woman has to go through this and go through this for a certain length of time, <laughs> <laughs> however long that is. And that's not for us to determine, actually, because it's determined by our ethnicity. It's right. determined by um, how good our lifestyle is, but we can control yeah. that bit. Mm -hmm. And it's also determined by our past medical history. So there's a whole series of factors that we sometimes have no control over. And we don't have control over the fact that we're going to go from perimenopause to menopause and post. That's written in being a woman. Mm. And so accepting that and working with it and realizing that it can be a very positive experience is a great, a great thing to do. It's mentally very freeing. Um, it's not easy because some of the symptoms are not easy. I mean, some of them are very challenging. Some of them are painful or deeply emotional, but accepting the journey and, and working with com having, you know, a sense of calm acceptance and perspective on this. And that's where meditative type of practices are very useful because mm. we build, you know, that ability to step, to step into that space and say, well, I can look for the good here. And that's what I like to encourage my clients to do is to look for the good things in here because they're there yeah, it, rather than being dug down in all the bad. <laughs> right. Um, it seems to be a recurring theme in my life the past couple of weeks is um, people keep talking about, you know, when whatever you resist persists. Mm -hmm. And I definitely think that's the same thing. If we would just allow us ourselves to transition in this case through, you know, the stages of menopause, you know, I think that there would be a lot less drama around it. And you would, like you're saying, you would just easily, I mean, not easily, there are definitely some physical factors, but um, yeah, I think the transition would be a lot more um, tolerable, maybe is a better word. <laughs> I think, I think so. And then my final thing is then to really have compassion for ourselves. Mm. The final component, when we have acceptance, we then have compassion and we actually begin to love the new us. And, and that is interesting because we have a society that overvalues youth. Mm, yeah. uh, and, and there's still a lot of saying, well, you know, and there's a lot of focus on women in that sort of 20 to 35, early 40s phase. That's where all the media representation is that becomes what's iconic. And we get a lot of messages about halting aging, about right. anti-aging. And it's a huge industry too. Right. You know, it's right. a massive, massive, multi-billion trillion dollar industry that wants to keep women, you know, feeling right. a bit bad about themselves. But when we bring compassion to ourselves, we're accepting the journey. We are loving the new us. We find a new sense of purpose. And we sort of say, well, here we are. We're this wise new woman. Yeah, that really women have so much to give. We are going to work another 15 years after our postman and we are we got uh, maybe more maybe, maybe more, more yeah you know for the, those people who are listening who are younger you're going to be working till you're 70 because that's the way the world is likely to be yeah. so we can't say suddenly that we're 50 just over 50 and this is now this is over hasta la vista it's over and we are going to accept sliding into an invisible space a corner a corner and disappear this is our time to be here to speak out and that comes from our own inner sense of our own values our sense of purpose of winding back that inner critic it needs to be in its box and and gone <laughs> we don't need you you're not helpful thank yeah, you very no. much to be. <laughs> and and this is what i think that that's my other pillar is starting to really decide what is my purpose what am i here to do what's my heart's deepest desire you know we don't have to you know take the world on fire and become the next president of the us so that would be nice <laughs> But we can, in our own way, fulfill more of what we want to do. And, and this is a great time. It's a time in our lives, too, when our children are going up, are up, going away. We have more freedom to speak our mind. 
and we also you know sadly probably don't longer care for our parents somewhere along the line that unfortunately does end for us and we are suddenly freed in a way that we aren't in our younger years so i'm i'm all for women in defining what they want and embracing it and going for it yeah i have noticed um and i don't know if it's just because i'm more aware of 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 like you know when you look for um like if you have an idea and you look for things like so when you were pregnant all of a sudden you saw all these pregnant women you know that kind of thing i feel like that is what i'm seeing with the women over 40 kind of like making a presence mm -hmm. and um i like there's a couple people i follow on linkedin that um are really like you know 40 and over is where it's at and i tend to agree with that. Like, I feel like, you know, in our twenties and thirties, twenties, I know I can only speak for myself. That was not, you know, that was immature area and, you know, and you were trying to figure yourself out. And then thirties is usually when you have your kids and you're running around and doing everything for everybody else. And then in your forties, it's like, well, I get to have a life too, you know? And I think that's awesome. Like my whole philosophy is, is that like I always talk to people about retirement and I'm like, I don't know if I want to retire because it seems like when people retire, like it just goes all downhill because they're sitting around, they're bored. They don't know what to do with themselves. So like you're saying, you know, find your purpose and it, and it doesn't have to light the world on fire. It could be something really small. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I think those points are very well stated <laughs> for sure. <laughs> um, but I think a lot of people, like the people that I talk to, and I've mentioned this on the podcast before is that, you know, they look at 40 and they think they have to get sent out to pasture and that it's all downhill. They'll never lose weight. They'll never do this. And, and I'm like, no, yeah. <laughs> that's just not, that's just not true. I, I turned 60 in a few weeks time. Uh, I mean, well, I only happy birthday then. <laughs> I started, you know, I started a business, a, a podcast. Look at, and you and I were on the same podcast training course. How many of those people yeah. were in their seventies and getting into podcasting? And the technology was not frightening them, and mm. they had amazing stories, and they wanted to be guests on podcasts. So, yeah. you know, go for it. Forties, nothing. Forties, <laughs> nothing. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, let's go ahead and dive in. Oh, let's talk about your books. I'm gonna talk about your two books. So talk about the first book um, that you have, The Mindful Menopause, right? Yes. Go ahead and talk about that one. Yeah, so I wrote The Mindful Menopause just coming up for two years ago. And I really wanted people to be able to have a book where they could journey from awareness to compassion in the book mm -hmm. uh, with guided practices around calming the mind and the body and learning to use mindfulness practices that were centered around the issues of the menopause, the perimenopause to menopause journey uh, that they could have as tools, whether they were journaling practices, meditation practices, breathing practices and so we could walk away with a little toolkit mindful toolkit for this time of life nice. and and live well and that's what the mindful menopause is about it's very much a, a mindfulness book but it just <laughs> happens to be centered around many of the issues because many of the issues that women have and experiences they have are also very much to do with the mental and emotional side of um, this journey and anxiety stress-related uh, illnesses, depression, moods, and very strong emotions are very central and very frightening at times. It, it's actually very frightening some of the anger we can release mm. at this stage. You know, we mm -hmm. can just go, where did that come from, you know? Yeah. And the same, we can feel a lot of grief, grief for the loss and the change in ourselves. We may have grief because our parents passed away at this time. We can have grief because suddenly we're not going to be able to have any more children and our children are growing up and going into their own lives. So strong emotions arise at this time and being able to work with those as well as the, the anxiety that comes from the changing hormonal status is very important. And approaching that mindfully and gently, we, it works when we're not 
in perimenopause. So there is mm. an absolute transference to this at this time of life. A uh, couple years ago, I mentioned to my husband, my husband and I are, he's only a couple months older than me, but I told him, I said, you know what? I will be going through menopause in the next 10 years. And I said, and our two children are going to be teenagers. I said, you should move out now <laughs> and I will let you know when it's safe to return. <laughs> that's, that's a heady hormonal mix. We're all screeching at their end and we're all screeching at their <laughs> Right, right. Which is hysterical. <laughs> so far it's been okay. So I have a son who's 15 and a daughter who's 13. So. Oh, in the beginning that, stages that that's early stages of teens <laughs> right <laughs> so we're still good on that um so tell me about the workbook that you have for everyone the quiet mind workbook and yes, i just downloaded it but i haven't looked at it so i, I will definitely check it out one of the i think if i start from one of the central pillars for me at this time of life is actually that we need to be able to press pause mm. you know we're on this fast conveyor belt and having time to reflect and, and take some time out is incredibly important. It's important at any time of life. But here, we are going through a massive transformation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we were a butterfly, we wouldn't go from a caterpillar to a butterfly. We would have a cocooning phase. And in some ways, perimenopause is that, although it doesn't feel like it. It is a time if we can slow down we can work through the changes we're going through on every level. And so The Quiet Mind is a, a short workbook of exercises that we can do that give us time and space to reflect, to um, drop into our body, to sit and think, to go out into nature, to practice very simple meditative practices. We don't have to meditate on a cushion and, you know, chant. That's, right. <laughs> that's not really, what, you know, that's not mindfulness for me anyway. But it, but it does allow us to, to have that reflective space and to go through a short practice and then write about it, reflect on it. What did mm. we feel? What did we learn? Yeah, I am definitely a big um, journal writer. So I, and I think there's something that has to do with connecting the kinesthetic of writing and your thoughts about it and visually seeing it. And I think that that's, and if you can read it out loud later using all those senses, I think it's really like sinks in a lot more because exactly. Yeah. I think when you just think about things, which I'm not like go for that, if that's where you want to start, but yeah, it's too <laughs> like out there, you know, yeah, exactly. Solidify. Exactly. And I think when we can do something like a workbook like this, we can keep coming back and reflecting on those practices and do them over and over again several times. Yeah. Um, because each day is different. So that's what the workbook is all about. It's about reflective space and, and exercises that allows you to do that. Awesome. And where can people find that? They can download that from my website. Okay, and go ahead and give your website. That is my name, clarissachristiansen.com. So they're on the home page. You can download that. And for the U.S. citizens, her last name is not spelled how you would think it would. It's spelled. <laughs> so <laughs> you can um, definitely head to shapeitupfitness.com for the show notes for this episode, and I will have all of her links listed there and how you can access either of the books. Um, so you can find all that information there. All right. Are you ready for the speed round? Everyone's I certainly favorite. am. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So question number one, do you like coffee or tea? Tea. Tea. What kind of tea? Any particular? Oh gosh, I'm I'm a good plain English breakfast. I was gonna person. say English breakfast <laughs> with milk. With milk. <laughs> I like English breakfast too, personally. I'm more of a coffee drinker, but I do like tea. I like chai tea, I like English, and I like Irish. All right. So what is your favorite place to visit in the UK? Ooh, I like the Cotswolds because they're very pretty. But there are so many great places in the UK, but I really like the Cotswolds. They're very pretty villages. Okay, I was going to say, what is that? Because I don't know what that is. 
Uh, it's, it's around Ox. If people know what Oxford is in mm -hmm. the UK, then um, it's the area sort of slightly to the west of Ox, west of Oxford, and it's a uh, collection of very beautiful, iconic British villages with little stone houses and lakes and nice tea rooms. <laughs> oh, cool. Well, if I ever go over there, I will definitely check it out. <laughs> um, what is your favorite book and why? Oh, well, actually, it's a book that I recently finished reading, and it's called The Theory of the Inflamed Mind. Ooh. It's by a psychiatry professor from Cambridge, and he really looks at uh, mental health. And I really love this book because it was the first time I'd seen someone in the psychiatry profession begin to recognize what was broken in the medical system and why people don't get treated through mental illness in the way that they should. Mm -hmm. And I loved his, his stories, his whole person stories where he'd started as a, a general practitioner and he'd asked the person how they felt emotion. He was told off when he became a psychiatrist, he had his stethoscope and he asked the person how they felt. And he was also told off and he was like, this is, you know, this shows where we are. And he really advocates an amazing whole person approach to some of the most severe mental illnesses um, in, in our society today. Mm, I would definitely have to check that out. Um, what is your favorite movie? Oh, gosh, what a question. <laughs> <laughs> I, love, I love movies. Um, I suppose I, I like things like Eat, Love, Pray. I just love okay. Elizabeth Gilbert's, you know, journey. And I love that. And, and it was a good representation of the book. But yeah, it's hard to pick that one. I was curious as to what you would say because I'm like they probably have I'm not that you guys don't have the similar movies that we have over here but I was like I wonder if she's going to say something I've never heard of <laughs> like it's just over in Europe yeah yeah um okay so the last question is what is your favorite inspirational quote ah I think my favorite inspirational quote must be that there's, oh, how does it go? I think it's breathe, you are alive. And it comes from Tishnath Mahan. And it's, it's something he just says, you know, because he focuses on the breath. And he just wears breathe, you're alive. You know, mm. his breath is, because his whole thing is, you know, that's the thing in life is just to breathe and breathe well. Yeah, yeah. And I think we take advantage or take that for granted a lot of times that, you know, our breath. All right. So, um, any one takeaway that you would give the listeners out there? My one takeaway is get to know your body really well. If you're a woman who is not yet in perimenopause, start tracking your periods. Actually get into some relationship with your monthly cycle because when it changes, you'll know before any test, something is, <laughs> something is changing for you. And my other takeaway is then for women, you know, who are there, track your symptoms, come into relationship with yourself and become the master of your own health. Yeah, great. Great. Well, Clarissa, thank you so much for being on today. I definitely know the listeners got a lot of value out of this podcast episode. And again, I'm so excited that you're my first international guest. <laughs> and maybe one day we'll have to meet up somewhere, wherever you are, because I don't think you want to come to Jersey. <laughs> Jersey. Maybe. <laughs> well, well, thank you so much for being on. and. Everybody have a great week and I'll talk to you next week. Thank you so much, Nicole. If you are looking for quick and easy meals to put together that have minimal cleanup time, then I want to introduce you to the No Fuss, No Mess, Shape It Up cookbook. This is perfect for the non-chef who wants quick meals, minimal cleanup time, and a smaller waistline. Inside your cookbook includes healthy recipes with easy to find ingredients, time savers in the kitchen, easy cleanup, and most meals are made in one pot. Spend less time in the kitchen and more time doing the things that you love. The No Fuss, No Mess, Shape It Up cookbook. 
now available at amazon com.